Yeah, okay. Uh, I think we're good to go. Yes. yes. Okay. Welcome back. Um, I'm very happy that Chris is uh, with us today. Uh, not just that he's Chris, but he would, like, he could travel and, and come to meet us in person. Uh, but yeah, uh, CMU is one of the websites that I'm checking on a daily basis and getting their emails on daily basis. And some of their guides are were crucial in my career development and understanding of the music business. So I think um, we're delightful to have him here and uh, that he's going to share some of the great insights that he's actually also doing uh, for Impala and by that also Runda members and we are very grateful for that. So I'm not going to talk more. Chris, um, take over. I'll be in the audience and if they have some questions, uh, please feel to ask him, okay? Welcome him to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to try and not move around the stage too much. Um, Good afternoon, everybody. It's very exciting to be here, first time in the country. Um, so thank you so much for the invite to uh, join you here today. Um, and yes, as was just said, um, I'm here to talk a little bit about some of the research work that we have been doing at CMU, about trends in the music business, and particularly trends and debates, and occasionally controversies in the digital music business. So that's what I'm going to be talking about here today. But before that, I will quickly properly introduce myself so you can see behind me. Uh, this is me. My name is chriscook.com. It's my website. It's where you can check me out online if you so wish. And I am the founder and the managing director of this company called CMU. So we're based in London in the UK. And we are a company that helps people to navigate and understand the music business. And we do that in a number of different ways. So as has already been mentioned, we report on the music industry every day. So we have a daily bulletin that goes out at around about 11 a.m. UK time, so midday Central European time, where we basically summarize all the key developments in music and the music industry from the previous 24 hours. We do have a little bit of a UK-US bias, but we also try to cover all the key stories happening everywhere in the world. And so basically, it's a nice, simple summary of all the key developments, stories, litigation, campaigns, releases, announcements, and deals in a simple email every day. We also have a podcast. So for those people who don't like reading, um, every week we have a podcast called Setlist, where myself and my colleague Andy, we talk about the key developments in music and the music business from the previous week. Plus on our website, we've got the CMU library with lots of guides and reports that you can download. As well as all of our news, uh, we also do lots of uh, training in the music business. We have our own training program. We do training for all sorts of organizations and companies in the business. We present at lots of events, like here today, around the world. We also have our own conference that sits within a showcase festival in Brighton, in the UK, each May, called The Great Escape. But the reason I'm here today is we also do lots of research on trends in the business. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today relates actually to at least three different research projects that we have been involved in in recent years. The first of those is called Dissecting the Digital Dollar. This is a partnership that we have with the Music Managers Forum in the UK. So the, the MMF is the, the network and organization for artist managers um, within the United Kingdom and beyond. Um, over a 1,000 managers uh, are part of the membership. And we've been working with the MMF for over five years now, seeking to help managers and therefore the artists they manage to understand how the streaming business works and how Spotify works, and how YouTube works, and how TikTok works, from a rights and royalties perspective. Streaming is a very complicated business, and so we have been endeavoring to help managers understand how the deals that are done between music companies and the streaming services, labels, distributors, publishers, and collecting societies, how they work, and how the money flows through the system. We've also been working with the Association of Independent Music, AIM, in the UK. This was a report we published a couple of years ago called Distribution Revolution, which was looking at the role of the music distributor and how that role has changed over the last 15, 20 years. 
And then, as was also mentioned in the introduction, we also have a big partnership with Impala, which is the pan-European organization for the independent music community. That program is called One Step Ahead, and basically every couple of months we publish a report available for free to the Impala membership. So if you are a Runda member, you're also, by association, an Impala member, so you can access these reports. There's also webinars to accompany every single report. And the most recent of the reports we published was called Understanding the Digital Music Debates. So these are the research projects which I'm going to pull from today over the next 35 minutes as I talk about key trends and debates in digital music. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about digital distribution. I'm then going to say a little bit about how Spotify-style streaming works. I'm then going to talk a little bit about some of the debates and controversies about the way Spotify works. And then finally, I'm going to run through the other digital music debates that we summarized in that Impala report. So I'm going to do all of that in half an hour. Um, I know you're all listening in a second language, so um, I will try not to go too fast, uh, but hopefully you'll be able to keep up. We will make the slides available, not quite sure how, but we'll distribute the slides. Um, so everything you see on the screen, you can have a copy of those. And of course, the digital dollar guides you can download for free, or there's a book with all the digital dollar work that you can buy. Um, the Distribution Revolution Report is available for free, and through Impala, the One Step Ahead reports are accessible for free as well. Okay, let's firstly talk about digital distribution and how record labels and self-releasing artists, artists who are basically a label in themselves, how they connect with the digital music market, how they get their music, their recordings, their tracks onto Spotify and Apple Music and Amazon Music and Deezer and Tidal and how they get their music into the services which are significant in certain emerging markets, like the Tencent services in China, or Ghana and Geo Savam in India, and how they get their music into the libraries that are now contained within apps like TikTok and Instagram and YouTube. Um, so, as an independent label or a self-releasing, self-managed artist, how can you connect with the digital services? Now, Here's the most important thing to say about every one of those digital platforms I just mentioned. Spotify, Apple, Amazon, Deezer, Tidal, Tencent, uh, GeoSavan, Instagram, TikTok, etc. All the digital music services have a key strategy when it comes to accessing content, accessing music. They want to get as much music as they can by doing as few deals as possible. And this has been true ever since the first digital music platforms emerged in the late 1990s, in the pre-iTunes era. The first digital services came to market and they said that we want to get as much music as we can by negotiating a relatively few number of deals. And that's still the policy today. What that means is if you want to have a direct relationship with a platform like Spotify, you need two things. First of all, you need a large catalog of music. Now, if you're working with a really famous artist or you control a really famous album, then it might be that you could persuade a Spotify to come to the deal to negotiate, even if you didn't have a particularly big catalog. But assuming you don't have that, then you're gonna to need to have a relatively large catalog of music in order to get to the negotiating table. You also need to have expertise in how these deals are structured. Streaming deals are really complicated. And so you need to have all the understanding of how those deals work in order for Spotify to sit down with you. Now you'll see that this immediately puts independent record companies, let alone self-releasing artists, at a massive disadvantage. Because independent labels generally don't have large catalogs. And because independent labels tend to have relatively small teams of people, most of whom are multitasking and doing several jobs, they inevitably do not have the expertise of how you negotiate a streaming deal. And this became apparent very early on. When digital music first emerged in the late 90s and the early 2000s, it became apparent that the indie sector was going to have a challenge here. Initially, in the late 90s, 
The Indies had an advantage over the major record companies, Sony, Universal, Warner, and there were more back then, um, in that it took the majors about five years to even talk to digital services. So in the late 90s, the majors were in denial about digital. They then decided that they were going to set up their own download stores, all of which were a disaster. And then eventually they did a deal with Apple and started negotiating with digital platforms. So during that period, the indies had an advantage in that the indies were willing to experiment with digital. But once the majors were on board, the indies were at a disadvantage. And so the indie community came up with a number of different proposals, or two key proposals, of how to overcome that challenge. Which brings us to today. If you are an independent label or a self-releasing artist today, well, there are basically three ways that you can get your music into the streaming services. You could try to get a direct deal. But as I've said, unless you have a large catalog and expertise in how to negotiate these deals, or you're working with a global superstar, the chances are you're not going to get a direct deal. So there are basically two other solutions. One is a Merlin deal, and the other is you work with a distributor. So basically, back in the early 2000s, the two solutions the indie community came up with were collective bargaining and aggregation. So half the indie community decided that they would form a committee that would negotiate deals on behalf of a network of independent labels. So between them, they had a big catalog, and between them, they had enough expertise. Meanwhile, some other labels allied with startup businesses, aggregators, commercial entities that basically aggregated a load of catalogs and then went to the platforms and said, between all of our clients, we've got lots of music. So we had the collective bargaining approach and the aggregation approach. And that resulted in the two options you have today beyond direct deals. So Merlin is a global organization. It's a network of independent labels and distributors, actually, that negotiates template deals on behalf of its membership. So whenever a new digital platform comes along, Merlin will sit down and say, across our membership, we have a really big catalog of music, plus we're experts in negotiating deals. So you should work with us. And Merlin then basically negotiates a template deal, and Merlin members can then choose whether or not to opt in. The other option is the evolution of aggregation, which is, as an independent label, or a self-releasing artist, you ally with a commercial entity, a music distributor, which has a big enough catalog either to negotiate its own deals or actually some distributors will use the Merlin deals. So to get your music into the system, try and do a direct deal. Good luck with that. Join Merlin and use the Merlin deals or pick a distributor. And in terms of the pros and cons of those different approaches, um, the easiest by far is to pick a distributor and allow them to do all the work. Um, the hardest is to do a direct deal. Having said that, in terms of cost, obviously if you do a direct deal, lots of costs up front to negotiate that deal and to get your music into the platform. But then once it's done, it's, it's relatively cheap. Whereas if you work with a distributor, they're going to charge you an ongoing commission, a cut of any money that your music generates. And then Merlin's in the middle. Um, Merlin also charges a commission, but it's 1.5 to 3%. It's a really small commission. Um, so basically, as with most things in business, deciding whether to go the Merlin route or the distribution route, you would have to have Self-releasing artists generally would not be able to qualify for Merlin membership, but most indie labels would. So in terms of making the decision, you're weighing up between which has the most costs and which is the easiest for you to do. The other quick thing to say about music distributors, and this is actually one of the big features of the Distribution Revolution report, is that Music distributors over the last 15 years have really started to evolve what they do. So if we look at the services that are available when you work with a music distributor, the basic services you would expect from a distributor are that they have deals already in place with the services, that they are able to get your music into the platforms and any accompanying visuals and videos and data that they are going to deal with all the data that comes back from the digital platforms 
and they're going to process the money that comes back. So that is what you will be looking for from a distributor. Basic aggregation, the services that those businesses in the late 90s and early 2000s brought to the table. But actually, a lot of distributors now offer a whole load of other services as well. So marketing services, sales services, admin, data, analytics, piracy services. So distributors now offer a whole load of services beyond distribution. And as a label, that can be very attractive because if you would do all these things yourself or you were to hire specialist agencies to do this work for you, you'd have to pay them up front. Whereas if you get your distributor to do it, often they won't charge you anything up front, but they'll take a higher commission of subsequent revenue. Now, actually, in the long run, you might end up paying more than if you just paid for it up front. But as independent labels, we're constantly dealing with cash flow challenges. And so therefore, working with your distributor on other aspects of running a label can be very attractive. And many distributors now offer so many services beyond distribution that they don't like being called distributors. And so we have things like label services and artist services. Those are distribution companies that do a lot more than distribution. In terms of another trend that we've seen in distribution, and this is more or less the last thing I will say about the distribution sector, not only have distributors diversified the services that they offer, they've also diversified their client base. So it used to be that distributors predominantly worked for record labels. So artists signed to labels, and then labels would use a distributor to get their music to market. But some distributors are now directly working with artists. And some distributors, like TuneCore and DistroKid and Ditto, predominantly work with artists. So now, as an artist, you have a choice. You can either sign with a label and then have all the support and the marketing and, and, and the help that comes from that label partnership, or you can set up your own label and hire the services of a distributor. Finally, in terms of what you might do when picking a distributor, here are all the factors that you should consider. I'm not going to talk about them now. There isn't time. But if you download the Distribution Revolution report, we talk through what you should think about when picking a distribution partner, and we go through all of these in turn. OK, so that is music distribution. Let's assume you've picked a distributor and your music is now going onto the streaming services, or you've signed up to Merlin, and you've opted into a Merlin deal, and your music is now in the system. Let's now just very quickly talk about how streaming works. These deals that Merlin and the distributors and the bigger labels are negotiating with a service like Spotify, how do those deals work? Um, the first thing to say is it's quite complicated. The second thing to say is, Streaming is not a per-play royalty business. And there's a massive misunderstanding, particularly in the artist community, about how streaming works. At least three times a year, a little graphic does the rounds on social media, which is basically a rate card for streaming. It will say, every time you're played on Spotify, you earn this. Every time you're played on Apple Music, you'll earn this. Every time you're played on YouTube, you earn this. And what that rate card will tell you is that Apple pays the most, Spotify's in the middle, and YouTube pays you the least. Whenever you see that chart, the thing to remember is there is no price list. There are no per-play royalties. That's not how streaming works. It is true that in any one month, we can take the money we received, and we can divide it by the number of streams that occurred, and we can get a per-play average. However, we don't begin with a per play rate and then multiply it up. That's not how streaming works. The other thing to say is, if you do a per play average on a global basis, it's hugely misleading. Because the per play averages in different countries are very different. Plus, the per play averages for free streams are always going to be a lot lower than the per play averages on a premium streaming service. So here we go, the streaming business model is a revenue share based on consumption share business. Um, and the mathematical equation I'm about to talk through happens every single month on a country-by-country -country basis 
and on a subscription type basis. So royalties paid by a Spotify style service are calculated separately for every country. And the free side of Spotify, a load of maths is done, money is paid. The premium paid for side of Spotify, a load of maths is done and people are paid. And those two are done separately. And if we look at this from an artist's perspective, from an artist's perspective, it's a three-step process. We have track allocation, then we have revenue share, and then we have artist royalty. So th these are the three steps of the journey that we go on in order to get everybody paid. So I'm going to talk through each of these in turn, starting with track allocation. This is what Spotify is doing each month. I, by the way, whenever I say Spotify, I mean a streaming service, okay? Spotify, Apple, Amazon, Tidal, Deezer, they're all the same model. Um, TikTok and Instagram, a bit different, but, but all of the subscription streaming services, they're all on the same model, but I tend to just say Spotify as code because it's the biggest. So basically what Spotify is doing every month is it's saying, okay, how much money did we make selling subscriptions in any one country last month? Okay, so you've got, we've got an, an amount of money that we made by selling subscriptions. Right, for every single track in our library, okay, so that's about 70 to 80 million tracks in the Spotify library, although I suspect about half of those never get played. Okay, so of the 40 million tracks that people actually play, for each of those tracks, what percentage of overall listening did that track account for? Okay, so if we take every single stream that occurred last month by a premium subscriber in this country, what percentage were this track? Now, it would usually be 0.0000001%, okay? Now, what we do is we say, okay, well, if the track accounted for 0.0000001% of listening, we will allocate to that track 0.0000001% of the money. Okay, so the percentage of money you are allocated is whatever percentage of total consumption you accounted for. And once we've done that process, the track now has a financial allocation. Then we get to revenue share. So streaming is a revenue share business. A service like Spotify says to the labels and distributors that it works with, whatever money is allocated to your tracks, we will pay a percentage of it to you. Now, Every deal is different, and most of these deals are secret. However, it will be approximately 50 to 55% of the track allocation is paid to the label or the distributor. Let's not forget some copyright law. As far as copyright law is concerned, songs and recordings, two separate things. So in the music industry, we have the record industry doing recording stuff. We have the music publishing sector doing song stuff. Um, so that 50 to 55% paid to the label or distributor is only payment for the stream of the recording, not the song. The song will be paid separately, either to a music publisher or a collecting society or a combination of the two. So about 10 to 15% of the total allocation will be paid for the song rights. So 50 to 55% goes to the label or distributor for the recording, 10 to 15% to the publisher or society for the song. So you'll see that that means the streaming service is keeping 30 to 35% of the money for itself. So quick recap of the process so far. Um, let's say in one month, in one market, Spotify made 10 million euro selling subscriptions. Okay, and then let's say that we've got a track that accounts for 0.01% of all streams in that market that month. That would be a big track. And that's probably a Drake track, okay? So 0.01% of all listening from one track. So we then take 0.01% of the 10 million and we allocate it to the track. That'd be a thousand euros. Then we pay, let's say 55% to the label or distributor, 550 euros. And then we would pay 15% to the publisher or the society. And now Spotify's done everything it needs to do. Spotify has now paid the royalties that are due for the streams that have occurred. But what about the artist and the songwriter? Well, let's think about the artist. As we've already discussed, on the recording side, 
Spotify does deals with record companies and with Merlin and with distributors. Okay, it doesn't do deals with artists. It does deals with labels and distributors and Merlin. On the publishing side, on the song side, it does deals with music publishers and with collecting societies. And then there are these hubs where collecting societies license together. So these are the organizations that Spotify does deals with and Spotify pays money to. Now, what gets paid to the artists and the songwriters depends on the deal that the artist has done with the label or distributor that they work with, and in the case of the songwriter, the deal they've done with their music publisher, and on, when it comes to collective licensing, on the collecting society's rules. So, of the money handed over, how much flows to artist and songwriter depends on the deal that the artist and songwriter has done with their business partners. So if we look at recordings, um, those of you who are labels will know every record deal is different. How much money a label shares with the artist will depend on the deal. It will depend on how much money the label has spent up front. It will depend on how big a risk the label took. It will depend on how much marketing the label has done. So it, it could be anywhere really between naught and 50, well, it wouldn't be naught percent, but it, anywhere up to 50% of the money. Um, in countries like the UK and the US, that, where the record industry is, what, 60 years old, basically the royalty that labels pay to artists has slowly increased over the years. So if you go back to the 1960s in the UK, artists were probably on a 5% royalty. Today, artists on a traditional label deal would probably be on something from 20 to 25%. Um, and smaller indies often do a 50-50 split with their artists. Um, so it will depend on the deal and also when the deal was done. And of course, today, artists can set up their own labels, work with a music distributor, and then how much the music distributor takes will depend on how many services they're offering, because remember, distributors do more than just distribution. But probably the distributor is taking anything from nothing, okay, in which case the distributor would have charged up front for its fees, um, or maybe up to 50%. If you're working with a company like Believe, and Believe is throwing a load of marketing and content creation and advertising at the release, then Believe might take up to 50%, because it's doing a lot, lot more than simple distribution. So how much the artist receives of the money handed over by the streaming service totally depends on the deal they did with the label, or if they're running their own label, the deal they did with their distributor. Which brings us to what I call the digital pie debate. There's a big debate going on in the music industry about whether or not the way the money gets shared out is fair, or whether we should change the way the money gets shared out. And I call that the digital pie debate. Now, this debate has been going on for at least five years, in the UK, this has become a really big deal, okay? Yesterday, outside the Parliament in London, a load of musicians gathered because they've got uh, an MP in our Parliament to propose some pretty radical changes to UK copyright law because they feel that artists are not getting a big enough share of the digital pie and that copyright law should intervene to change it. But there are plenty of people within the wider music community in the UK, who feel that maybe some artists are not getting a big enough share of this money. Maybe some changes need to happen, but the solution is not a radical change of copyright law. Because every artist label relationship is different, and therefore, while some of those deals may be unfair, there aren't really industry-wide solutions. But the key thing to say about the digital pie debate is this. There are actually multiple digital pie debates. Because remember, there are three steps to this process. And there are questions to be asked at each step of the process. So if we take track allocation first, OK? So we've got track allocation, revenue share, artist royalty, remember. So let's, let's think about track allocation first. You may have heard about the user-centric approach as a proposal. So remember what I said. At the moment, what Spotify does is it says, OK, let's pick a country. Let's pick Germany. How much money did you make in Germany last month? Of all the streams in Germany last month, what percentage were of this track? 
okay? And then we divide the total amount of money by the total percentage of streams, and we have an allocation for that track. There are some people who argue that rather than doing the maths for the whole of the German subscriber base in one go, the maths should be done separately for every single subscriber. So rather than saying how much money did we make in total, and what percentage of total streams did this track account for, what we should be saying is this user, okay, of this user's money. How much money did they put in? 10 euros. Okay, of that user's streams, what percentage were this track? Okay, let's say it was 1%. Okay, we're going to take 1% of the 10 euros and allocate it to the track. That's a user-centric approach. The reason why that would make it different is that on a service like Spotify, some people are high-level streamers and some people are low-level streamers. Some people listen to Spotify 12 hours a day. Some people listen to Spotify a few hours a week. And at the moment, the low-level users are subsidizing the artists and songwriters and labels and publishers behind the music listened to by the high-level users. And some people think that's unfair. And the solution would be a user-centric approach, where we actually divide the money and allocate money to tracks for each individual user's subscription. Um, there are both pros and cons to the user-centric approach. Um, Deezer has been trying to persuade the music industry to shift to a user-centric approach for some time, so far unsuccessfully. SoundCloud already uses user-centric, but only with its direct independent creator community. SoundCloud is unusual in that anybody can upload music to SoundCloud. As well as labels and distributors, individual artists upload music too, and it's with the latter group that SoundCloud is using user-centric. So there are pros and cons to the user-centric approach. One of the reasons why people support user-centric is the argument that the current system favors mainstream music, English language music, Anglo-American artists, and it disadvantages more niche genres and labels and music scenes. And there is a proposal that user-centric would shift some of the money from the superstars and the mainstream genres to the sort of middle-level artists and the more niche genres. That said, the research isn't conclusive on that. Maybe that would be the outcome of user-centric. Maybe it wouldn't be. Okay, nobody's 100% certain. Which brings us to another change we could make, what's known as the artist growth model. The artist growth model has been developed by AIM in the UK and Impala, and the idea here is, okay, well, if the issue is that the superstars are getting too much money and the middle-level artists aren't getting enough, why don't we unapologetically take some money away from the superstars and give it to the middle-level artists. And that's a thing called the artist growth model, another proposed change. Other things that we could do, at the moment, a play is counted when a track has been listened to for 30 seconds. That's not really very fair if you're in a genre where the average track is 10 minutes rather than three minutes. So that another proposal is maybe we should be paying more money to the longer tracks. Maybe the length of the track should be taken into consideration. And some people also think that the royalty you earn should be different if the fan specifically seeks out the music versus the track being pushed to the fan through a playlist or an algorithm. So these are all ways that we could change the way we allocate music to tracks. Then we get to step two, revenue share. Is it fair that the recording gets significantly more than the song? Some people would say we should change it. We should give the song a bigger cut of the money. Um, they might say that you know, labels don't take as big a risk in digital as they did in physical, and therefore the song should get a bigger cut of the money. But there are arguments to say actually the current system is fair. Actually, songs get a bigger cut on a stream than they did on a CD already. And OK, labels don't have the cost of pressing up CDs anymore, but arguably the marketing costs have gone up. So there are arguments for and against. And then we have the question about, well, what about artist royalties? Um, should artists be getting a bigger cut of the money? And some people would say, yes, they should. 
Um, because again, the label's costs are lower on digital compared to physical. Maybe some people would say labels generally sign artists a little bit later today than they used to because we're expecting artists to have already released an EP before we sign them. But equally, labels are still taking big risks when they sign artists. They're still pumping an awful lot into marketing. And indeed, many labels are paying a higher royalty on digital today than they used to on physical in the olden days. So there are pros and cons and debates on whether or not artist royalties should increase. In some ways, when it comes to the artist share, I would say the debate is different depending on whether or not we're talking about artists who signed deals in the last few years or artists who signed deals decades ago. And of course, there's the whole debate about whether or not session musicians should be cut into streaming money. At the moment, they're not. Um, in terms of the artist royalty, if we agree that artists should be getting a bigger cut of the money, the question is, well, how do we make that happen? Can copyright law interfere? And there are various ways that copyright could interfere. I'm not going to explain what those are today because there isn't really time. Um, although these are the proposals that were made in the UK Parliament yesterday. So if you go to the CMU website, I basically explain all of those in the context of what was proposed in the UK Parliament yesterday. But as I said, there are plenty of people in the music community and, and both independent and major labels and some managers who would say, even if you think artists in general should be getting a bigger cut of the digital pie, there isn't actually an industry-wide solution that copyright law can force. And what we need is a more transparent and equitable industry. There are plenty of indie labels who actually have already started paying higher royalties to artists, including on old deals, who are very transparent about all of that. And there are some people who would say, we should take the brilliant labels who are already doing this really well, and then we should put pressure on all the other labels and the major labels to follow the lead of the good guys. And actually, that would be a better solution. Finally, before, might have a few minutes for questions. Um, the digital pie debate that I've just described tends to be the thing that gets the most airtime. It's the thing that we have lots of articles written about, lots of presentations about, lots of panel discussions about, particularly at the moment and particularly in the UK. Um, that said, it's worth being aware there are plenty of other issues in the digital music market that as labels and artists you should be aware of and you should be reading up on and that you should be forming opinions. And in the One Step Ahead report that we published with Impala a couple of months ago, we talk about the digital pie debate, but we also talk about issues like stream manipulation, streaming service algorithms, local catalogue and cultural diversity, fan data, and director fan. Um, now, if you download the report, remember, as Runda members, you can do that for free. We explain each of these in turn. So stream manipulation is where artists or labels hire devious companies um, to basically artificially stream music. They set machines listening to Spotify, and they pull more money out of the system than they put in. It skews the stats. It means money goes to the wrong people. Really, the streaming services need to stop stream manipulation, but the industry needs to put pressure on the services to do so. Streaming service algorithms, we know the algorithms power discovery and recommendations on the services. The algorithms are secret. They're constantly changing. They're really hard to understand. There's an argument that the streaming services should be more upfront about how their algorithms work. Spotify are piloting a service which will allow you to inform their algorithm, which is really good. Unfortunately, they're charging for that service, which is less good. Um, so I think a lot of indie labels would say, it's great that you're going to allow us to inform your algorithm, but that should not be a paid-for service. We have issues that streaming services like Spotify are very proactive in certain markets and less proactive in smaller markets. And that can have a big issue when it comes to things like discovery and recommendations. In some countries, lots of effort is put into supporting artists, getting behind artists, and driving discovery. In other markets, a lot of it is left to the algorithm. And there are arguments that actually if a streaming service can't justify having on-the-ground expertise in a market, it should be forming partnerships with the people who have that expertise already, which would probably be the local independent music community. 
Then we have issues around fan data, which basically is all of the data that comes in from various digital platforms, and the fact that both artists and labels need access to that data. But data is regulated in much of the world, so how can we share data in a legal, efficient way? And then the last thing is this. Today, I've been predominantly talking about Spotify-style streaming services because they are the single biggest revenue generator for the record industry today. Two-thirds of the record industry's income is coming from streaming services on a worldwide basis today. And in some markets, it's a lot more than that. That said, the digital, marketing, the digital market is evolving. and We've got another Impala report called the Diversifying Digital Market where we talk about this. I think the next 10 years, the big services which in terms of growth, are going to be what I call direct-to-fan propositions. Things like the live streaming and digital gifting tools that already exist in Instagram and TikTok. Making exclusive content available to the core fan base through platforms like Patreon or Bandcamp. Doing VIP online experiences with fans where either the fans pay an upfront fee to get access or there is, you know, donations being taken while the stream is going through. Maybe even the sale of the non-fungible tokens or NFTs that everyone's become obsessed about. These are all huge opportunities in the music industry. And it's an interesting question. Well, is that activity artist-led or is it label-led? Okay, what content is being used? What rights are being exploited? How does this impact on the artist-label relationship? And I think it's important to recognize that while, yes, today, the Spotify business is where we're making the most money, this is where we're going to start to see growth in the next 10 years. It will have an impact on the artist-label relationship. And artists and labels should be talking about this right now. Um, and looking at the way they work together, looking at the deals and saying, okay, how can we both get the most out of these opportunities and what does it mean for our relationship? So there you go. Those are the other debates to be aware of over and above the digital pie debate. And I would say all of these are as important as the big digital pie conversation that tends to get the most press. Um, and there we go. Um, one last plug. All of these things are constantly evolving, so you need to stay up to date with what's happening in the music business, and the way to do that is to sign up to the CME Daily Bulletin or the Setlist Podcast, which you can do so at completemusicupdate.com. I think we have about two to three minutes left, so if there are any questions, we can take those now, uh, or if not, I am going to be around for, for I know, an hour, two hours maybe, um, so I can always answer questions one-on-one -on -one, because I know we've got another presentation coming up very soon. But I think there is one question here in the middle. Hello. Hello. First of all, thank you for the amazing presentation. I wanted to ask you what kind of uh, changes would you personally make or what do you think are the proper changes that need to take place in the pie share, both the fees paid to the labels First of all, because I know that all the streaming services uh, work in, uh, they don't make money, they, they work with loss, actually. So they don't have enough more money to pay for every song. Uh, anyways, what's your, what are your thoughts uh, for the best changes that could be possibly made? In terms of how the money gets shared across the industry, um, I, I, because I've, I've, I've been researching this for so long, and I know every side's arguments so well, Okay, and as a company, we work with everybody across the music community. I actually quite find it quite hard to have an opinion. I think probably the song should be getting slightly more, but not necessarily, you know, hugely more. Um, and I think whether or not artists are being treated fairly depends entirely on the deal that they have negotiated. Linked to what you're saying, though, I think one of the challenges for the entire industry is A, getting more people to pay to stream than using the free services. Now, that's a market by market thing. In countries like the UK, and the Scandinavian countries, a lot of Spotify users are paying. And that's great, we're making a lot of money. You've then got other markets where everybody's on the free version. And that's a challenge because the money we make from free is so much less. So how can we put pressure on the streaming services to get more people pay paying? And then once we've got a decent number of people paying, let's put the prices up. Um, and that is now slowly starting to happen. In the big, mature markets, Spotify is slowly starting to put the prices up because actually the price has not kept up with inflation. So I think 
Let's get more people signed up for premium. Let's put the prices up. All of that said, remember those director fan opportunities. I think sometimes we just think Spotify is the only revenue stream. It's not. It's one of many revenue streams. And a lot of the growth in the next 10 years is going to come from these other revenue streams. So it's getting your head around those other opportunities. Do you think that Spotify can make like a donate button for every artist? Well, they do. They have that. They have that already? Yeah. They, they launched that during COVID. Personally... In terms of director fan stuff within Spotify, like the donate button, to date, Spotify has dabbled with director fan, but it's not been very good. Um, they have now got a partnership with Shopify on the merchandise side, which is, with, uh, Shopify is a great platform. But I, I think Spotify are going to ramp up their director fan tools in the next 10 years for two reasons. First of all, I think that's where the growth is going to be. And Spotify will want to be where the growth is. The other issue Spotify has at the moment is if it takes any transactions through an iOS app, it has to pay Apple 30% of the money. Spotify is trying really hard, backed up by all the Fortnite players across the world, to get rid of that 30% commission to Apple. And I think they will. And I think that's the point at which Spotify will really... So I think at the moment, all the director fan stuff within Spotify is not very good, but I think they will really ramp that up in the next few years. Although you could argue, actually, platforms like Patreon and Bandcamp and other director fan platforms are doing it better already anyway. Thank you very much. Okay. Do we have time for one more question? Okay. I've got this question here. Thank you, Chris, for a great presentation. But I think you forget about one very important key player in, in this uh, pie, the finance ministries. Because in Europe, you have very high VAT tax. That means that in my country, there's 23%. That means that finance ministry takes more than songwriters. It is true, and when I talked about youth-centric and I said that the German subscribers putting 10 euros a month in, obviously that's not true. They're putting probably more like 8 euros in because, because sales tax is applied. Obviously that does differ from country to country. And because Spotify, certainly in, across Europe, it has consistent pricing, it's 10 euro, um, and then it's 10 pounds in the UK and it's 10 dollars in countries where they have dollars. And of course, um, because sales tax is different in every country, it does mean that the value has an impact. So yes, campaigning to not have any VAT or certainly full VAT on, um, on, on, on entertainment and culture uh, would be one way to increase that pie. Um, obviously, the tech giants are worth so much money, they are not the people to campaign for that, because why would you give a company worth so many billions of dollars a tax break? So it's sort of pushing it from the, from the artist-songwriter perspective. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the great presentation. <laughs> We're moving on uh, immediately. I'm not going to talk much. Jake, welcome you to the stage. Um, uh, we're going to start with the presentation immediately and then we're going to have a break uh, after this and then we have the final, how they called it, box match. Uh, just to put this in. Okay, Jake, maybe uh, uh, until he, he makes the, the computer Good. work. I'm ready. Um, I'm not going to talk much. I'm going to leave it to you. Uh, I'm here in the audience. But maybe you can present yourself first to the audience. And Excellent. Let them know what you do. And, Certainly. And so uh, my name is Jake Beaumont-Nesbitt, and I'm an artist manager from London. I work with Indian artists, and I advise US artists. And I'm also part of a network of artist managers in 60 countries, and we're just setting up MMF Serbia. Um, and it's called the International Music Managers Forum, and I look at innovation and networking. And what we're increasingly seeing is that the role of the manager 
whoever's looking after the artist is hard to describe based on the conventional old conditions and understanding of the industry. So if you think of the manager as somebody who shouts at the record company and the record company is somebody who takes and puts in a lot of investment and takes the artist to market, increasingly what's happening is labels are acting as the manager, managers are helping the artist to self-release and it's really fuzzy as to what those differentiations are and I don't think I really see them anymore other than people will self-describe as a label or a manager. But if you speak to them about what are you doing, they're doing lots of different things. I'm gonna dive into a brief history of the industry, which you guys all know inside out, but I think it's important in the context of looking at where we're going so that we can see where we want to move forward to. I'm gonna talk about Web 3.0, which is something that a lot of people are very buzzy about at the moment. There's a lot of magic words and magic ones like um, blockchain, NFTs, that are being thrown around as if they're like solutions for something. And they're just tools. So I want to make it really clear that while I'm talking about this space, I don't think that I'm very excited about it. I think it's very um, big opportunities, but it's not something that I think is really easy. So this isn't a presentation where it's like, look, look at all this stuff that's happening. You guys can just grab it and make loads of money. It's really simple. It's how do we get into using these new tools and how do we develop them? So really this is, is a conversation with, with you guys and myself as to um, what are we looking at. So the industry started off as the live industry and then you had um, in 1720, in 1710 in the UK, there was an act for the encouragement of learning by vesting the copies of printed books in the authors or purchases of such copies during the times therein mentioned. So copyright came out of book publishing in 1710, and any process to reform copyright is kind of leaning back, looking back on all this clutter that we built up since 1710. So we went from the live industry to the publishing industry, books go to sheet music, and now publishing's a long way distant from sheet music, but that's where it comes from. At the point where the gramophones were invented, the publishers used them as a promotional device for songs, for the compositions. Roughly Elvis is the start of the star system. Once Elvis comes along, instead of performing a song in your local pub, radio station, whatever, with the local singer, you need to have the definitive Elvis version. You can only have Elvis's version because the technology's changed, the recording industry comes along. But if we think of Elvis as a brand, in the way that Rihanna is a brand or Ronaldo the footballer is a brand, live, then publishing, then recording, and then the last thing to emerge was the artists. And that's really through the individual artist is where the record industry comes from, that it's essential to have that definitive recording of that, that work, not to play it at home yourself on the piano. And that's where we end up with the, the sort of structures of the industry. In 1976, Willie Nelson moved to Austin. Grandmaster Flash was breaking out of New York on the back of cool DJ Herc and developing hip hop. The Sex Pistols were blowing up in London. We had a sort of dis disruption of the established model in 1976 where DIY came in and independent labels. Um, that's really crucial in looking at what's happening now. The technology changes the culture changes, not always exactly in sync, and then the consumption changes. And it's really, what happened in 76, I think was like a nuclear explosion that everything we're dealing with now comes from. And at that point, where you had the established industries and the sectors, that's where you started to get independent artists, independent labels from. Um, Napster came along in 1999 and tore down a lot of the traditional assumptions about how you would monetize. Um, so if we think of performing artists there being Elvis, live publishing recordings, Elvis comes along, makes the star system, the performing artist being central to everything, fandom, then independent artists, independent labels, investors in artists, and then digital comes along with Napster. What's next? Looking back all the way back to the 1700s, 
there's a pile of rubbish has built up. We keep building on this tip of like new innovations coming on, new changes, new things happening. Um, it's so easy to say it's time for a revolution and we need to change all of this. But normally what's happening is people are adjusting all that junk and rubbish that we've built up historically. Um, just zooming in on, I hate using the word copyright because it's so misapplied, but intellectual property rights, it's misapplied in that it's used as a catch-all term for things that aren't necessarily the underlying copyright. Um, we're familiar with the, the record label, the master recording and the performers, and the musical work and the authors, and we know that often if you zoom into what the author's rights are, you've got all these fragments, which are then really hard for any users of music, be they a consumer or a user that's a licensee. It's really hard to navigate that whole area. And that's all part of this rubbish that we've built up over time. The whole thing's kind of collapsed, that people are breaking out of it. And, and a lot of people in the industry aren't aware of how much value has left the traditional measures of the industry. Um, Chris referred to what's happening in the UK and some of the stuff that's happening in the UK in the proposed legislation is based on rules that have already been changed in the EU or have been addressed and won't get changed. So you kind of don't need to worry about it. There is a thing that Chris brought up where, um, so this is fixed streaming, where a bunch of politicians are saying that we need to disincentivize record labels from investing in artists. We need to disincentivize artists from investing in their own career. And we need to pull money out from that investment that we make and put it into session musicians and put it into um, collection societies and their overheads and their charitable donations. So it's really a, a proposed, the, the core of what's happening in the UK at the moment is a, a proposed tax on creativity to make everyone feel good about supporting artists and musicians. And I think it's really important that we grow up as an industry and stop hiding behind um, touchy-feely, we're all here to protect the musician, because we get distracted by that towards a sort of opera model where we're trying to rely on handouts from the government or the banks or whatever, and, and then it's quite easy for them to justify how high the VAT is. How do we go hard on being entrepreneurs and making the most money possible? Um, meanwhile, in Indonesia, a lot of artists have just are not part of the system that the UK would understand. The, the European Union has different operating systems slightly from the UK, but if you look at the UK, as it traces its concepts of how the industry should work all the way back to the Statute of Queen Anne, and then it's got a lot of established success from the Beatles forward. So it has a sort of sense in the UK that, that commercial music is really valuable and important and it has a role to play in the cultural life and obviously that happens anywhere in the world people are music fans people are artists the hierarchy of who's got the most valuable um, understanding of the value of music is ridiculous so it's really important to kind of look at different systems my experience of coming to eastern europe is that there's huge amounts of innovation because a lot of the old implied support systems and um, assumptions about how we work are not here. A lot of artists had to get through and a lot of labels had to get through. And for example, at the moment, it's really hard for anyone from Southern or Eastern Europe to really push themselves on Spotify and get the attention of the global Spotify machine. So I think the context is different here. There's problems, there's barriers, exchange rates, the amount of money that you can charge in the region for accessing a gig is smaller than in, in, let's say, Germany or France. So it's very hard to compete internationally based on the money thing. If we set aside the money thing, which is a huge thing to, to set aside, there's a massive, massive opportunity here because you're not stuck looking back over your shoulders at hundreds of years of history of how we're meant to do this and why we do it. In Indonesia, they're ignoring what's happening in the UK. They're getting on with um, using NFTs to self-release albums. Um, CDMX, Mexico City, huge um, hotspot of musical activity, drives a lot of sales globally for Spotify. Mumbai is the main city. It's not the capital, but it's the main cultural city 
of 1.5 billion people living in India and then a large amount outside of India. Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, East Africa, Kenya, Tanzania are really booming. We hear a lot about the music that's coming out of Nigeria. Nigeria has Nollywood, an equivalent to Hollywood and Bollywood, but it's on a bigger scale almost in terms of number of films produced. Stuff is happening outside of the Anglosphere the traditional Anglo-American record industry, and New York and London have been essential for many years in informing, informing what's happening in Brussels. And that's at a policy level, not necessarily the, in the way you guys are operating. You're just getting on, being entrepreneurial, being innovative. So I don't want to over-labor the point that I'm not accusing you guys of, of looking at the UK too much or following us, but I just want to be really clear that we're getting further and further behind with each new development in Indonesia and India in how we monetize and how we reinvent this industry. The last major reinvention was artists themselves bringing in alternative country, hip-hop, punk to disrupt the music scenes. Um, the traditional industry approach is in real danger of missing the bus, and I think that bus may have already left, but it's really hard to find evidence of it because the music has changed in subcultures, which is very similar to what was happening in hip-hop when it was incubating in New York. Not everyone outside was aware of it, but massive changes were coming that we can now see as it's the biggest genre globally. Um, I touched on Elvis as a brand, and his story, his sound, his style, his sight are absolutely essential to who he is. So the sound, yep, yeah, that's the music. The style, the sight, the visuals, the artwork, how he looks. Um, the story, what, what is he trying, what is he singing about, what is he saying? And increasingly artists are having a say in social and cultural conversations. And as people online have more access, more hours with the artist, they want to pay more attention to what the artist is into. So thinking back live, then publishing, then the recording industry, we've gone much wider than that. The value of the artist is way wider than that. The key thing that the artists have is they have passion, they have heart. And that's what the consumer engagement comes from. When you look at a platform like Spotify that's just streaming music and they're trying desperately to diversify into podcasts and um, spoken word audio, because they know that they're going to be outcompeted if they just say, we're a music streaming service, because music becomes increasingly bundled in with other activities. Um, Tesla is, it says here, 30 startups with some of the best tech talents in the world. So if you think of Tesla, it's a car company, it's electric vehicles, it's a battery company. They're putting solar panels on the roof. The solar panel's charging the battery during the day. The car isn't being used. The battery, the battery's selling its electricity back onto the grid. The technology that Tesla has from all those miles that they've driven with all those cameras, they're able to sell data to how do we get robots to drive around and deliver things. And there's a load of businesses can come out of Tesla. It's really extreme to compare the opportunity of an artist business to Tesla but I think we've really got to get that approach into it, not be so stuck like Volkswagen were, they're not anymore. And we we do cars, we sell cars. With the music industry, we sell records. It's gone, it's blown. There's massive opportunity outside, massive growth opportunity. The Swiss Army life, a slightly over-labored metaphor, but it, it's definitely appropriate. We haven't thought how we capture that. We don't know how we do it in contracts. Our contracts are still a publishing agreement, a recording agreement a personal appearance, a brand, an endorsement, Adele's signature, Rihanna's face. We haven't gone beyond um, how we capture all of that value. It's happening on a case-by-case -case basis with individual artists doing amazing deals. When you look at the rest of the world, the, the, the business world, companies are increasingly, including the petrol companies, worried about ESG investing, environmental, social, and governance. Big companies, Nike's, Dutch Shell are taking on how do they present themselves, Volkswagen are doing it, as something emotional, something connective, something that has a heart into it, because they realize that the consumers are so well informed and so, so much cooperation and community happening online that you have to have an emotional connection. You can't just sell the best in class. Companies, all the biggest companies in the world are increasingly thinking about how do they bring that into their proposition, not just what have I got the best product? How do they bring heart into it? 
what we're selling as an industry is emotional connection, empathy, understanding. When we have to break that down into the record company, the publishing company, the manager, it kind of gets a bit lost. Um, community, culture, and creativity. Facebook have pivoted towards calling themselves meta, and they're thinking about how do they get much more involved in empowering the communities. They've got a lot of problems that they face with that in the way that they've behaved historically. They're seen as a bad actor, and people kind of stay with Facebook because they have their networks on there. Spotify doesn't have networks on it. It's not a social media platform. It, it, it's attempted to be. It's just a content platform. So how do we as artists monetize the engagement, the things that companies like Tesla have a massive advantage over Volkswagen in, in that Tesla has an emotional connection. It's not just a better electronic vehicle. It's a cooler electronic vehicle. We're selling engagement and we're selling artists who's become the center of a community, a culture, a dialogue, and we're selling creativity. This is a, a chart from the beginning of the year, from January the 1st, of Disney versus Spotify. I think it's the most interesting chart for us to watch at the moment, because Disney's had a really bad run with the last film they put out, The Eternals, and they haven't had such good data for their streaming channel, uh, Disney+. Plus. But ultimately, Disney owns the Marvel Universe, it owns the Star Wars universe, it owns the Disney princesses, it owns the classic Mickey Mouse characters. It's got a series of communities built around entertainment products. You could imagine Disney owning Elvis and creating holograms of him and spin-offs from Elvis. I would assume in the long run that Spotify will fall away from Disney and Disney will go up relative to Spotify. And I think we have to think, how do we focus less on the business that Spotify's in and more on the business that we're natively in, that we come from, which is the business that Disney is in, is organizing fan communities around amazing, engaging content. Adidas, this is from the 22nd of November, this is from this week, are doing stuff in the metaverse with NFTs, and they're trying to show their heart. Nike have done probably been the world leading of the sports companies in connecting by supporting athletes like Colin Kaepernick, who took the knee, a sign of disrespect for some people and a sign of respect for others during American sporting occasions, um, American football. And Nike took a side in that argument, which was them showing their heart. You could imagine an artist standing up and saying, I'm against this, I'm for that. It was very unusual for a massive global company to do that. It's really important in talking about where we're going as an industry to get rid of the one size fits all. And I'll keep hitting Spotify because it's the easiest one to think of, but they offer a one size fits all solution. You've got to go in and play their game and get on their playlists. And very few artists make any money from it or get on the uh, key playlists that will support you over a number of months that then give you start to allow you to build up fans just having a bunch of streams on spotify from a, a big playlist for a couple of weeks you probably won't see your facebook engagement increase you probably won't grab or capture fans it's a kind of dead end so it's then really hard to say well what else do we do instead there's all these other areas to operate in it's also really hard for a record company to say well I own the recording and this is what I monetize and that's the biggest channel at the moment for an outlet for recordings. It's a bit of a dead end for most of us. Um, bands that create a sense of identity and controversy build up really powerful connections. With these guys, with the collective, I've spoken to people in New York, I've picked up on their accent and said, oh, do you know them? And they're immediately transported emotionally back home, back to Kosovo, talking about their roots, their culture. There's a community around this band that's very unusual. Um, and it's a very powerful thing. And something we need to remember looking from this area is it can be done. It, we've, it's been proven that it can be done. So the traditional model for an artist, SME, small medium enterprise, would be their brand, the Elvis bit, their personality, their profile, the publishing rights, the live rights, and the recording rights. Where we're moving into is much more a community business. Disney's a community, Tesla 
is a community. We have problems with metadata. We're not identifying effectively like we're focused on the recording metadata and the publishing the works metadata, and not so much on the Elvis data. Who is he? What's he doing? How do we know when he's picked up on Twitter? How do we know when he's trending on Instagram? Um, ISNI, International Standard Name Identifier, is an ISO standard run from Geneva that any artist can have. It's essential that we spend less time wondering how much we're going to pay session musicians, and we spend much more time on speaking to policymakers on how we adopt data standards and metadata standards so that whoever the investor is, if it's the record company, the artists themselves, a third party, can track all of the usage of this cloud of activity around the artist. Um, the Ethereum name service is coming up hard on our shoulder and you might find a lot of artists, for example, in Indonesia starting to register themselves on a blockchain and not having much faith in our traditional world of collection societies and the industry allocating names and numbers to an artist. They might go and get their own names and numbers. Um, all of this clutter is based on hundreds of years of copyright and it's a barrier to investment. It makes it very easy, uh, very confusing for new money to come into our game. And what I'm kind of describing is there's a breakdown of where you would invest anyway. And the 360 model has kind of been blown out. That The 360 model was really dysfunctional and it was like, well, I'll sign you for publishing, I'll sign you as an agent, I'll sign you for, uh, for, as a record label, and then I'll also sign you as a, a personality and we'll do four separate deals and we'll make sure that they're not cross collateralized and they're not because it would be unfair on the artist who might be able to break that down and get it elsewhere. We've really got to get beyond that thinking. How do we solve? So we've got to, how do we reinvent the contracts? How do investors in artists, how are they incentivized going forward? How do they participate in the bigger picture and for the long term? And most of the money is nothing to do with copyright. For Rihanna, selling underwear and makeup, recordings is valuable. It's a marketing tool and she makes a lot of money from it. But she's making more money from her other areas of operation. Ronaldo, the footballer, makes more money from his social media presence from Instagram than he gets in a salary from Manchester United. How do we tap into that? Because ultimately we're investing in that. When you invest in an, an artist in their recording career and then they can go and make money elsewhere, you've built that. How do we, so we need to solve that. What's the investment solution? How do we stop making it more and more fragmented and confusing? And then we've got to solve how we get into that space that Adidas are really good at, which is uh, authenticity and community. So um, Web3, nobody really knows, like there isn't a, a standard de dictionary definition of it. Web1 was the static web, Web2 is the social web. So if you think of Web1 as early developers, bunch of geeks in lab coats, sending messages on early email to each other, or it's a consumer going to a, a website and just reading it and having no interaction with it. Web two is social web, people putting comments on YouTube, people exchanging information, people sharing things. Web three is the decentralized web. This is one definition. We don't yet have, have a full on definition. It will move us away from a world in which communities contribute. So for example, social media, People leave comments, they drive activity, they drive engagement, but they don't get any in, in incentive back other than enjoyment. They don't profit through that contribution. How do we break away and make con community-centered economies of scale? When I think of what bands from the region have done, they've built communities and they've taken audiences with them internationally and they're able to reach into the diaspora. The economic opportunity is relatively small compared to artists from some markets, but the community is strong. And that's something that you can then scale and reach into other audiences. It's hard, but that's probably what we should be focused on building, community brands. Traditionally, managers would be the person who's helping the artists do that, but we all know that often it's the record label who's leading that side. I don't care who it is on the artist team or what hat you put on them, label, manager. They're investors and they're helping the artist to develop their audience. And we don't have a way to share in the benefit from that. 
And we don't talk about the artist's output or product as building community. We talk about their output as how many streams have I got on Spotify, how much royalties have I got from the local collection society. We're missing the trick. We're behaving like Volkswagen, not thinking like Tesla. Um, again, back into trying to grasp what Web 2 is, what Web 3 is. Web 3 is Twitter would be uncensorable because there's no central control. There's not a, a CEO running the platform and saying, well, these, these breach our standards. That really opens up opportunities for artists to communicate and share things because they're not subject to the, the platforms pushing back. Payments can also be sped up and made direct without intermediaries. So you can have a, an artist or a label or the investor being paid directly from the consumer without going through the platform. So where we got to the point where artists were excited that they were removing the record company, and then they're like, actually, we need to go back because we need help from the record company for marketing. We're now getting to the point where maybe we can remove the platform, which is really challenging. Um, these are a few takes from Twitter from this week on what what is Web3. Wear a suit, Web1, open source code base, Web2, build on an open system, Web3. An open system is kind of scary because it, it in, implies there's a lot of work for us as artists or people enabling artists to reach their audience. We're at a very early stage of this Tools are coming along, people are building opportunities for artists to get into that space and push their music out. Uh, many of you will know Vitalik Buterin, who's half my age, um, Russian based in Canada, who developed Ethereum. Ethereum is a blockchain platform that allows smart contracts to run on it. And Ethereum and other blockchains that are built to, in a similar standard to it or to improve upon it are examples of the backbone of Web3. We have the opportunity to go without the traditional gatekeepers, the CEO of Twitter, the CEO of Spotify, and deal directly with our consumers. PEX, the um, company up there, they're based in Prague and Los Angeles, and they're probably the best company in the world for tracking what's happening online, and they're really innovative. Um, the, the bottom picture is showing someone with looking at a hologram of how they tool stuff. What would Elvis do with a hologram? Or what would Elvis do with being able to share um, if he's singing the, the teddy bear song? Can he, could you share an NFT of a teddy bear as a hologram to an Elvis fan? And what would they experience with that? We're starting to get into haptic technology where suits and, and almost um, invisible layers would be put on your skin that would stimulate goosebumps and feelings and emotions. We can drive into a much richer environment, potentially online, than we can offline, which is counterintuitive. So much of the money in this region comes out of live performance and live shows. How do we go, okay, let's look at digital and think how do we l increase the intimate experience and create a better environment online. There's lots of tools coming down the pipe. We need to get away from thinking back to the old system, the old structures and controls. Um, you've all heard about the gigs in the metaverse. That's part of Web3. How are all these things related? We can build communities and we can share communities. How do you get a bunch of metal artists from Macedonia to share their fans with a bunch of metal artists from Mexico. At the moment, it's really hard to do that within a platform like Spotify because you're reliant, you can create your own playlist, but they're not going to get much traction. If you can say to your fans and similar artists to you, or labels as a group, if you can imagine uh, Motown having a partnership with another label that they felt an affinity to and swapping playlists on a platform that they control, it's a, an amazing opportunity. What would, if you were Elvis's label or Elvis's manager and all this stuff's coming at you, what Elvis did was he left the music industry and went into the film industry. Not sure it was the right decision, but artists are free to move around and find their money. Remember, we're not one size fits all anymore. So that worrying too much about how are we going to push the price of streaming up all day, if anyone's got an, uh, a solution to that, 
go for it. But we're probably better off investing more time in how do we build contracts that allow people to invest in artists and get a return on it for the artist's activity away from the recording. And potentially that's the record label. Potentially the label or the manager or whoever it is, is a brand manager. And they're a partner, and investor in building up the brand in the same way that Disney is with Mickey Mouse and Spider-Man. It's ridiculous to compare an artist who is a person, a human being, with, with a cartoon that is controlled by a, co a corporation. But there are ways into discussing how we develop new contracts to do that. Um, NFTs, non-fungible tokens, everyone's buzzy about them as a collectible and the, the value of them goes up. There's so much more than that. And most of the conversation I'm hearing at the moment is really narrowly focused on them as collectibles. They're smart contracts. They're ways that we can swap value with the artist, the artist and the audience, and we can look at things like, okay, you bought a ticket, the ticket is a contract, the ticket says that the artist will, in a year's time, allow you backstage access to the next show that you come to, or whatever. We, this is this, there's no one size fits all moment, is we can invent all sorts of ways to add new experiences and content, the ticketing has been taken care of by the live agent and the promoter, not by the record company. But if you're bundling content that the record company is invested and controlled in, such as exclusive videos and filming, it should come together. Um, a blockchain is a huge shared spreadsheet. It's not a magic weapon. It's just a giant chain that keeps data on it. We need to not fixate too much on the mystery of NFTs and blockchains. They're tools. We need to use them in the same way as we use CD pressing and digital distribution. Booking agencies, I think, are really at risk from what's coming with Web3. That Fans that buy tickets can communicate more easily with their artists and can have other artists recommended to them and managers, investors, labels, whoever is, is representing the artist can get in touch more easily with promoters around the world. There's more and more promoters in this region dealing directly with artists now than there used to be because touring artists are much happier with email, with the stronger um, distribution of business English as a common language across the, across the continent, across the world. It's much easier to deal with people. Booking agencies are at risk of being disintermediated and to a large extent publishers. Not publishers where they're going after sync deals, but publishers where they're doing the admin. Once you can start to place the metadata on a huge shared spreadsheet, you don't really need a publisher to take care of the admin. Marketing agencies potentially are going to be disrupted as well because you'll have much more in the way that some artists are intuitively good on Instagram and they know how to express themselves. It's going to be really, really hard for marketing agencies that rely on exclusive access in magazines or on television adverts to control the conversation. We need to be talking a lot more we need to spend a lot less time about how much money are we getting from Spotify, why aren't we getting on more playlists. We need to spend more time discussing the sort of things that Nike and Tesla talk about, which is community. Curators is anyone who's pulling together content from creators to show it to consumers. So a Curator could be a record label. Motown was a curator. People would buy stuff from Motown because they had the Motown badge, even if they hadn't heard of the artist. Radio stations, DJs, playlists. There's a bunch of curators out there who help direct consumers towards the artist. And they're not necessarily just in the traditional channels anymore. How do we find more curators and empower them? And if we have... Um, different stakeholders around the artist controlling different fragments of what the artist does, it becomes very hard to empower the artist, the creator, to have a conversation with the curator about how they build community and get directly to the consumers. Um, currently, to organize a community, we need the permission of the platform. Facebook control how you can build groups on there, who's censored, who's not. Once you start to remove these intermediaries, the platforms, 
and you go direct from the creator to the consumer or via a curator. A curator would be could be someone who's booking a festival lineup. That you always go to that festival because you know the lineup's always good. These people who deal directly with the consumer are so important to us and we need to somehow let them share in the value that we're creating because they're helping us. Um, probably the best iteration I've seen so far of Web3 is Audius. Do, do any of you use Audius? It's a, like an alternative to Spotify that's based on the blockchain, but the blockchain is just a huge shared spreadsheet. So don't worry, don't fixate on the blockchain. That's just the underlying technology. What Audius does is it allows labels as curators or anyone else as a curator to build an area on their platform. So if you imagine Spotify suddenly saying, you can charge what you like in a walled garden area of my platform because you've built a community on it and you guys can keep all the money. So a label that's here that's dealing in EDM could have a partnership with an EDM label in Finland and one in the United States and they could curate, create an area on the app in the consumer's pocket that was maybe gated to the first thousand people who asked to join that community or maybe it was gated by if you were at the show you got access to it through your ticket. Ways to create exclusivity will help us to incubate artists. When hip hop, alternative country and punk came through they happened in the margins and they had time to grow and incubate and find their sound and build their community. And as we rush too fast and hard on these global platforms, we're not able to do that. Audius is its really simplistic to describe as an alternative to Spotify, but it's basically, you can build record shops on there, you can go and just be available, the artist can be available generally, or you can build exclusive communities on there. Um, no one's really, people are experimenting with it, but the things that you can do on it, nobody's actually actioned them yet. We're really early on it. The absolute most exciting thing that's happening at the moment is DAOs, decentralized autonomous ledgers. So the blockchain, huge shared spreadsheet. Um, that's, I don't know why it says ledgers there. That's me being up since 3 a.m. It should say organizations, obviously. So decentralized autonomous organizations. So decentralized, they're not controlled by a single um, hub CEO set of rules. Autonomous, they're independent of any other action. So the rules that you put into the contract, the agreement that runs the DAO, is what runs it. It runs independently of anyone else's input until the participants in the DAO, let's say there's 100 people joined together to create this organization, vote to change it. If they don't vote to change it, it sticks to those rules. It runs those rules on a smart contract, an NFT. Um, what is the CMO? A collective management organization, performing rights society, collection society. It's a huge centralized autonomous organization, sometimes not so autonomous, sometimes controlled by the government. If creators, investors can come together and share their rights, pull their data into organizations where they've, as a cooperative, agreed on the rules at the beginning, and if you don't like the rules, you don't join, there's a massive opportunity to not so much replace collective management because the radio stations that rely on a single point of licensing will want to keep that. But for other uses, such as Audius, how would you come together and provide licenses going forward? And how would you receive all this usage data back from a platform like Audius and make it match the, back, the data that you're getting back from YouTube and the data that you're getting back from Spotify? And how would you sell that? Anonymized, you wouldn't sell who the consumers were, but you would say metal fans, um, enjoy wearing Adidas more than Nike, and all of the artists and labels involved in that space could then say to Adidas, you need to come and market to our audience. So you can start to create networks, communities of artists and investors, labels and managers, publishers, to control 
how they behave. What is a fan club? It's a large, decentralized community around an artist. The more decentralized you can make it, um, BTS, the K-pop bands, artists, kind of run, they set up their own fan clubs and run them themselves. They're not run by the band, they're not run by the label, and they drive massive value. Disney has the potential with its content that it owns to create large communities, networks of fans who self-organize and create greater value, and they decide how they're gonna pay. So when we're arguing about how do we push the price of Spotify up, how do we force the consumer to pay more, what if the consumer sets the price? These sort of radical things that, that came out of that initial thing of um, making downloads available and not worrying about the price, that's festered and incubated with the consumer and with a lot of artists, and it's a massive opportunity. It's something we've we've stopped pushing back on, but as you see what's going on in the UK at the moment, not everybody has. Um, crowdfunding, if you think of a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization where you said to all the fans, if you guys put in 10 euros each and there's 100 of you, we'll go in and record a new single and you'll get access to that single and maybe we'll, we'll put it out on the radio. We're familiar with crowdfunding, but this a DAO takes crowdfunding a step beyond because it allows the audience, the consumers, to participate um, and potentially in the rewards. So we, we're widening with DAOs, we're widening the potential pool of investors because we're simplifying. It's in a smart contract. It's not confusing. Don't understand all these fragmented broken rights. We just say in the the rules of the DAO, any royalties from these songs, including on the publishing side and recording side, would come back into the middle. High net worth individual who wants to invest in the artist going out making recording, and let's say the artist has access to distribution. So at that point, you, it's like, okay, I don't need a label. I've got an investor, I've got distribution, I've got an audience who are organized. But the label can become a stakeholder in the DAO as well. The label can invest, and maybe they invest their skills in marketing, maybe they invest their, their skills in A&R, and maybe without giving any money into the pot, they get a percentage. So we can reinvent, instead of the labels, particularly indie labels, taking all the risk and not participating in the wider reward, we can start to pull all these wider rewards into a transparent contract that shared maybe with the fans, it doesn't have to be, maybe with outside investors, maybe it's a group of labels who've got similar artists. We can really reinvent how the investors are incentivized and reward and how we build community directly around the activity of the artist. Um, I think th the main things we have to think of going forward, cohorts or groups or tribes, if we're building communities, what are the things that pull them together? And especially online, that's not so much geography anymore. So the, the tyranny of being in a small country or having a low GDP or having an exchange rate that's not favorable with other countries might start to be eroded. It doesn't disappear, it's a fact, but it might start to be eroded if we can connect communities by genre, by social interests online without having to go through the platforms so labels can start to make partnerships, artists can start to make partnerships. And that's the way we can build up the value of these communities. Disney, the value of Disney is their fans. They're obsessive about respecting the Marvel fans and not upsetting them with the history of Marvel films and identity. And they think long and hard about that. And obviously all the independent record labels all the artist managers, and particularly all the artists, are obsessive about that too. That's what we all put most of our time into. We don't put most of our time into thinking about the, the pennies, the cents, the dollars, the euros coming back from the streaming platforms. When we're having these conversations about how we create great music, great art, great community, great value, we can probably start to think, actually, how do we pull the money out of that? I don't have any solutions for you. <laughs> But it's just a really exciting time to be part of this conversation. Have any of you got experiences of being in a DAO or any of the Web3 stuff? Someone at the back with a hand up, I think. 
uh, yes, I, I'm just uh, experiencing with DAOs and uh, I, I see all the Discord channels with all the voting and, and some guilds behind the games and, uh, and bands and everything. What do you think? What's your impression? Is it, is it, a f is it very sketchy and vague or are you starting to see real business opportunities in there? I see a lot of opportunities in it, and I'm I'm working in a in an NGO, and and like, uh, uh, like foundations are working in the same as as uh, without DAO as well. So like we are collecting collecting money in a in a specific region and redistribute re it to the local people as well. So and, and the people who give money in the in the center can vote on where where to put the money in. So I, I think a lot of foundations are already working in it, but without DAOs, so I hope that the DAOs will help them to uh, automatize these these processes. Just just for being back what you said Consumers, users, contributors are putting money in and then they're making choices about how that money is used. So it's kind of like crowdfunding on steroids, but it also allows <laughs> for many different layers of this. So when a DAO last week tried to buy for $20 million a early copy of the American Constitution and they lost out, I think they, they raised 20 million US in like four or five days. Some people were putting in ten dollars. Some put in, Some people were putting in a million. It's an amazing way of allowing for the community to decide what value you put in. And we've seen this with the BTS fans that some of them are very active in doing arts and design, and some of them are organising shows to get the band along to as guests. Um, there was someone else who was putting their hand up about DAOs. No, Michal. Go for it, it's not irrelevant from you. Just take the mic. No, it, it was a little bit of um, off-topic comment, maybe not that much of an off-topic comment, because it's. Uh, I just realized that um, that the community building that we do for that we've done for so many years is yeah. pretty much what you what you describe. I mean, the Web 3.0. It's like um, we've been trying to to move the um, static information from the. Uh, web.0. Um, I mean, that's that's what an old business used to look like, and uh, we are already in web, web 2.0, and um, we've been trying to, to distribute the the um, creative um, or distribute power amongst and the people to create a new music um, business model in Poland. That that's what we do with communities, but so far. Um, it's it's uh, it's a very funny thing, but so far we've been missing out the digital tools. Um, I think it's because of my personal preferences for real human contact. But uh, your your presentation was very inspiring, and and uh, Ma Mate is that uh, <laughs> yeah the, the the first <laughs> panel as well, in in the sense that they realized that that I I've been missing on a very important tool that allows to form communities and to form, um, to transfer the power to the communities. So thanks for that, That's, that was the comment. So a little bit that, off topic. That so firstly, anyone who doesn't know him, speak to Michał afterwards, who's a community organizer in Krakow, Poland, the region beyond. And he just puts in all the time and people sort of gather around him and he creates value. So it's it's brilliant. Yeah, and then I should have I should have introduced myself. No, 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 of course, not not all of you know me. How come? And, um, then, and then the second part of that is he's like, I'm not sure this really applies. This, we've killed the one size fits all model. So it definitely applies. It's like, how do you make it apply? And then the third point of what he's saying is, we're doing real world stuff, and this is a bit digital. The definite the thing that's hardest to get your heads around with this is it's complementary to physical. So oh, yes. you go to, I know, I know you, you got that because you're saying, you, right, you, how, you, how do I, I do You make this? me realize it. This is so funny because I've, I've been living with computers for like 90% of my life and it's, uh, it's a big part of my life. But at the same time, it's, um, I was for some reason trying to avoid it. And uh, you just made me realize that it's so complimentary. And uh, yeah. A big barrier is the way we've done contracts traditionally. 
And a really important thing is to come to events like this and try and reinvent contracts. Because at the point any of you individually, an artist, a publisher, a label, a manager, go and speak to a lawyer and say, we want to somehow share the value, maybe with the fans, maybe with a local skate shop, maybe with a, a radio station. The lawyer's just going to look it up in the book and go, no, we don't do it that way. We have to find and incubate the right lawyers to come to events like this to help us build value. And everything we're talking about is putting the artist first. So when I'm reacting against what's going on in the UK at the moment, they're saying, we must pay session musicians. They're, they're holding artists up in front of them like some sort of sacred thing, like you can't attack what I say because I've got the artist, I represent the artist, I'm sacred. What everyone in this room is doing, if you're an artist or if you're an investor, and even if you're not putting money in, you're putting time in, we're all investing in artists. We, we don't need to have that conversation about do we support the artists. Yes, we all do. How do we find much more efficient ways to bring in new money, particularly when you have an economic disadvantage in the region, but you don't have any cultural disadvantages? You don't have any creative disadvantages. And there's possibly some threads here that we can pull at to overcome the financial barriers. Okay, anybody else, no? Jake, thank you very much. Uh, you're around, you can you know, approach him and, and ask him questions. Um, we're gonna have 15 minute break, and then we have a box match, Macedonia versus rest of the region, uh, and, and to see what's going on, especially in Croatia, and especially with the copyright stuff, and then Croatia is, is leading the way, but maybe in the wrong direction. Okay, thank you, see you in 15 minutes. <laughs>